maybe you have a better idea. <laughs> okay, I propose Europeans. Uh, we're looking for planets now. There's Glissify 81G. We call it the Goldilocks planet. That's a planet it or orbiting its host star. Where's G? There's G at the bottom. It turns out you can do the math and you look at the host star and ask, where is the distance from the host star such that water likes to be in liquid form? Liquid is kind of important for life as we know. That planet is right in that zone and we call it the Goldilocks zone. So our inventory of planets outside of our solar system, here's an artist's image of it. Most they made it quite Earth-like. You know, they got clouds and that's very wishful thinking, I think. But nonetheless, because it could be a planet that doesn't look anything like it. The moon is in the Goldilocks zone of the sun, but there's no liquid water there. You need other conditions as well, an atmosphere and things like that. But it's tantalizing to think how many other Earth-like planets are out there. Now, life on Earth, for so long, the tree of life, in our hubris as humans, we, we drew humans at the peak of some, some, some tree of life where we're some kind of pinnacle. Well, if you really lay out life on Earth, you get, I have now a, a circular tree of life. Check this out. This, uh, this is widely available on the internet. Right here. So the beginning of time is the middle. And all these lines that come out, you're advancing in time, and the diversity of life continues to grow. We're not a closed system. We're getting energy from the sun. We have a source of energy, you can grow complexity. And so today is the outer perimeter of this circle. And most of us, when we grew up, it was like the, the, the old fogies out there. We have the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. And those are represented in the upper left quadrant and the upper right. But there's like fungi has, 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 has revealed itself to us as a fundamental part of the tree of life, in this the circle of life. Uh, Protus, and a small part, there's bacteria down there at the bottom, and archaea, other branches of the tree of life. You might ask, well, where are we? Where are we? Hmm, I don't know. Where are we? Are we someplace? We gotta be someplace. Oh, there we go. There we go. Are we sure that's us? Let's see. Let's keep going. Are we sure? <laughs> Holy <laughs> sapiens, there it is. Okay. There we go. There we go. We're there. And by the way, this is one one thousandth of the known species represented on the perimeter of that image. Uh, you can't fit them all. We're there. So the diversity of life on Earth is extraordinary. I, it's something to celebrate, I think. But also, the, uh, to be honest about it, you have to. Oops, where am I going? To be honest about it, you have to recognize the fact that every life form on this has common DNA. So that it looks like it's diverse, but in fact, it's not. At its most fundamental level, we're all the same. You want true diversity, grab an alien from another planet that has no DNA at all. Now you're talking diversity. Then you can have that conversation. That's why these animals, in, these aliens in Hollywood, there's no imagination. Give me something that's not, you know, you know what the best alien ever was? The Blob. Who remembers the 1958 Steve McQueen B movie, The Blob? You remember that movie? It was a, it was a blob. That's what it was. And it liked your blood. There were no bones, there was no face, there was no digestive tract. There were no feet. It didn't want to fall wrong. It was just the blob. The title of the movie was The Blob. <laughs> Best alien ever. I should give out alien movie awards. We are catching up with that stuff here. Black holes. Who doesn't love black holes? So in that same delivery of uh, photos that I got from NASA, I got the very first um, uh, very first full color image of a black hole. Here it is. <laughs> Notice the detail. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want that. I want 
So here's how you, so the way to show it, you don't, this, if you fell in there, you're not coming out. So just avoid your eyeballs entirely. Just, just keep, keep your distance. And they flay nearby stars. This can't be good for us. The star cannot like this as it happens. And we're pretty sure there are black holes in the center of every galaxy, which emits hugely energetic jets. And so we have a black hole in the center of the Milky Way. It's not as big as the black hole in the center of the Andromeda galaxy, a neighboring galaxy of ours. Ours is like 600 million times the mass of the sun, plus or minus, I forgot the exact number. The one in Andromeda is a billion times the mass of the sun. So some people have black hole empty, you know, because ours is as big as there. If you look at our galaxy from the side, uh, so you see the bulge in the middle there. You can do this in different bands of light, and you see different things. So you take a look at sort of the 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 uh, the flocculence, another good word, the flocculence of the gas falling in and out of the disk of the galaxy. But in another image, we found bubbles of gamma rays bursting out above and below the plane. These huge bubbles coming out. And we're implicating the black hole that was there. Because the black hole can, can create energetic phenomena like this in its vicinity. But this is a, a, a testament to the fact that we need other kinds of telescopes to see what's going on in the universe. Not only will telescopes tell you what's going on in the universe, so do colliders. The European Center for Nuclear Research, which I am told, when spoken in French, spells CERN. <laughs> The Center of European Research UPA. Like they just mix up all that and they get that word, CERN. Do you ever hear CERN? Those are the four words it stands for. And they have what's called a Large Hadron Collider, the most powerful particle accelerator in the world, which, by the way, would have been one third the power of the superconducting super collider that we were building in Waxahachie, Texas in the 1980s. We would have had the most powerful particle accelerator in the world. The budget was cut entirely by Congress in the early 1990s when there were mild cost overruns. <laughs> now, why was it cut, you might ask? The, our country's been funding nuclear and particle physics the whole century. What's going on? I don't know what happened. 1989! They started this in 1983. 1985. 1989! What happened in 1989? Peace broke out. <laughs> Peace broke out in 1989. The wall came down in Germany. The Cold War ended. Oh, without a Cold War, why do we need physicists? Because they're only doing this because we wanted them to have a bomb at the other end of their accelerator. And so, the good thing about science is somebody's going to do it, whether or not it's you, all right? So as a scientist, I'm glad somebody's out there doing this, but as an American, I kind of wanted, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. Well, you do this with me, right? <laughs> they're looking for what they call it, the, among other things, they're looking for the Higgs boson, which in some circles has been called the God particle. The God part. You know, everybody's attention perks up anytime you see God mentioned with science. So, so they call it the God, because I think we're trying to sell books and stuff with this, with this concept. The God particle. The, the Higgs boson is a particle that gives particles their mass. Right now, the mass is just something we measure. We don't know why a proton has one mass and an electron has another. We just measure it and assign it to the equation. The God part, the Higgs boson, if it exists, would be granting that mass to the particles. It would be a deeper understanding of the behavior of nature. They're still looking for it. They haven't found it yet. But this piece of machinery is one of the biggest piece of hunks of hardware in the world I've ever seen. This is one little piece of the accelerator. Accelerated protons to huge energies that rival the energy of the beginning of the universe. That is the ring underneath the town I'm told that when you turn on the ring, your TV set jiggles a little when you're <laughs> in the image. <coughs> Actually, the old days that would happen. 
nowadays, uh, back when they had tubes, it would have happened. Now, 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 not the case. Is that the air conditioner? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's your particle accelerator. <laughs> I feel it. <laughs> Some people are worried that if you turn on this accelerator, can you still hear me over the Yeah. yeah. You may up, maybe up the microphone a bit. So they, some people are worried that it might make a black hole. So there's a, there's a hilarious YouTube video of a surveillance camera in the parking lot of CERN. Okay, and there's a timer clock at the side, and it counts down to zero. And then all the cars fall into a black hole. It's really hilarious. Um, just look up parking lot, CERN, black hole. We'll go straight to that surveillance video. Now there's some news, just a couple, of, 10 minutes ago. I told you this would be late breaking news. What happened at CERN? Have you been following the news? It wasn't 10 days ago. Neutrinos behaving badly. <laughs> There's a subatomic particle called a neutrino. And they just fought for brains, because they can make neutrinos in abundance in this particle accelerator. Neutrinos go through solid matter like when you walk through air. They're very hard to interact with, but you can detect some of them. They thought that they had to find them, so they beamed neutrinos from Switzerland to Italy. They go straight through the Earth, neutrinos don't care. And they timed it, and what they found is that the neutrinos got there faster than a speed of light would have taken them. They found neutrinos going 10% faster than the speed of light. Now, that's neutrinos behaving badly. You're not supposed to do that. We have a century of experiment that shows that the speed of light is not just a good idea, it's the law, okay? And, a thoroughly century of experiment with cogent theoretical foundation for this being the case. And so, this was the result. Okay, so, so it was a big mystery. So they published it, everyone scrambled to try to understand it. There are three possible causes. One of them, it's a mistake. That happened, it's a mistake. Two, it's not a mistake. They actually are traveling faster than light, but they're moving backwards through time. You can travel faster than light. You just can't go through the speed of light to get there. You have to sort of be born at that speed. And if you are, you move backwards through time. These would be backwards time traveling in trio. That would be just fine in Einstein's relativity. Third is that we need some extra physics to account for it. But those are distant second and thirds to the possibility that it's just a mistake. Five days ago, six days ago, a calculation was released that show that the folks who beamed the neutrinos, we think they forgot to take into account the fact that the neutrinos are moving in a direction different from the GPS satellites that are handing out the time codes for what's being measured. And so because of that, it's not just two stationary spots on Earth. There's moving neutrinos. So the neutrinos move this way, in that direction, the GPS satellites are in another direction, you've got to do the, the relativistic geometry calculation for that. And when they did that, they perfectly accounted for the 10% speed. That in fact, the neutrinos time dilated by exactly that amount. So it was just a blunder. If that holds up, it's just a blunder. Like I said, when you're, that, when you're essentially testing, it's really hard to bust out of that. Oh, yeah, a few more, a few more. So, hey, dark matter, 85% of the gravity of the universe has no known source. Is gravity out there, oh, well, here's a star, here's a cloud, here's a black hole, and here's a dark cloud, here's the planets, uh, 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 comets, and it all up. It doesn't give you all the gravity we see. Dark matter, that's what we call it. We don't know what's causing it. Dark matter. That's just a placeholder, we call it Fred. That's <laughs> not Friends out there, okay? <laughs> don't read too deeply into those two words. We don't know what it is, but we measure it. Meanwhile, we find out that there's a mysterious pressure in the universe making the universe